So we have been looking at a generic skeletal reaction mechanism skeletal because we are only looking at intermediates being present here we are we are oblivious to the presence of uh, uh, the other uh, stable species reactants or products except of course saying that we start with some stable stable species and you would end with some stable species this need not be the same as that uh, so this is like a gas phase termination this is a surface termination we want to distinguish between these um, and uh, we want to notice that this is a chain propagation step this is a chain branching step if alpha is, a, is greater than 1 and uh, ultimately we now write a uh, rate, rate equation for the concentration of um, the intermediate as this where F's actually are uh, essentially uh, factors on, on the reaction rate constants uh, because the, the, these are not this is only skeletal so this is this F's, F's are the ones that represent the, the rate constants um, and, and the uh, yeah and uh, then we apply the steady state approximation and get a expression for the concentration of the radicals intermediates with which we now try to plug in in the uh, expression for the uh, rate of production of the final product and we get this expression right. So uh, what we mean by a chemical explosion is when your DCP over DT goes to infinity and uh, that happens when the denominator goes to 0 and the denominator can go to 0 only when alpha is greater than 1 and uh, alpha is great alpha greater than 1 indicates a chain branching situation that means you now have a uh, a creation of radicals more more and more radicals in the second step right. Uh, so this is what we have seen so far the additional thing that we have also begun to notice so far is question is what happens as you now change the pressure right. So as you change the pressure we expect that the surface termination should actually try to come down because the molecules are busy colliding among themselves rather than colliding on a surface okay the surface location is fixed its surface area is fixed whereas the molecules are actually trying to collide with each other as you increase the pressure more than they actually collide with the surface the same same molecules the probability of collision among themselves is more when compared to collision with, with a with a surface therefore the surface termination is actually going to decline as you as you as you uh, increase in pressure. So if you were to now try to plot uh, how this, this is going to happen so let us suppose that you plot your various F's that are participating in this uh, equation uh, with pressure so let us now say we have a pressure showing up we expect that Fs should decline. Uh, like this and uh, on the other hand for a similar reason Fg should actually start increasing as you increase in pressure because you now have to have more and more gas phase termination happen as the, increase, the, the, as the pressure increases relatively speaking therefore you are now going to have a, uh, a curve for Fg that goes like this now put these two I am sorry should, should have looked at. Uh, So you need to have a the gas phase uh, go up like this in fact th there is no reason to believe it would actually ever flatten out uh, the, uh, because as you keep on increasing the pressure the, the Fg should keep on increasing pretty much nonlinearly and therefore we now expect the Fg to go like this and then we are now looking at Fn, Fs and Fg together you see because they are termination uh, reactions therefore your Fs plus Fg is now going to go like that so as you increase in pressure initially Fs comes down and therefore Fs plus Fg comes down but as you as you as you uh, increase in pressure further Fg grows up even though Fs comes down and that makes up for it and therefore uh, the Fs plus Fg keeps increasing further. Now this together is now balanced by the Fb alpha minus 1 right so the question is how does that go and uh, we expect that you now have to have a uh, uh, production of uh, uh, intermediates because of uh, chain branching and that need, that need, that need not necessarily uh, grow with pressure forever right. So that means we, we expect that this should actually go more like that right. So this is uh, now Fb 
alpha minus 1 that means as you keep on increasing the pressure the chain branching need not happen forever so it begins to level off uh, after a point but the interesting thing here is the question is when is this matching this right and graphically we can now see that fs plus fg now is the, the having, having the same value as fb times uh, alpha minus 1 here and here so there are two pressures at which you now have this patch happening that corresponds to the denominator going to 0 which corresponds to the rate of production of products just exploding right so if you were to now look at how the the uh, dcp over dt is going to fare with pressure right we now try to say let us just bring this down right so strictly speaking I, I, I need only one half of the positive domain so I could, I could draw a, a, a axis somewhere up there uh, allowing for some space at the bottom as well uh, because we are looking at net production of products which could go negative. So what, the, what this means is we are now looking for some production of products that starts from somewhere um, we, we do not know exactly where to start let us say some, press, some pressure um, low, low pressure and then it goes up to infinity right and in between here you now start with a negative infinity because the denominator is now beginning to flip sign okay so you are now having um, uh, if you now go here you now have F, fb times alpha minus 1 greater than fs plus fg so you just had a flipping of signs so it, it starts from negative infinity goes all the way up and then comes back to negative infinity again and you now have uh, a flip, flipping of signs again right so what is going on we are now saying that uh, at, at low pressures you have a significant uh, 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 significant surface termination and uh, and then there is some point as you now keep on increasing pressure that the intermediates are beginning to actually get produced by chain branching much more than the rate of uh, uh, termination okay because the, the termination is actually coming down as you increase in pressure so you are producing more and more intermediates and creating an explosion and the other time so and then you now get into a explosive regime and uh, you, you know that the other time you are now going to have an explosion is uh, when, when the reverse happens that means you now have a lot more gas phase termination right and, and uh, so the gas phase termination keeps increasing but the production is not increasing that much okay so, so that this, is, this is now tapering off and then you now have a reversal again of fs plus fg exceeding uh, uh, fb times alpha minus 1. So these two uh, pressures now or we are looking at pressures essentially right that means we have not really bothered about what, what we are doing with temperatures okay. So the reason why we are doing that is because with pressures we can think about collisions increasing or decreasing or surface curves termination um, declining in uh, importance relative to gas phase termination and so on all these things are pressure related we have not thought about temperature so it is as if like we have kind of fixed the temperature okay. So the corresponding picture if you were to now bring in temperature here and pressure were to be plotted over there okay. would be to now look for a curve that would go like an inverse S where you were to fix your temperature at some point at any point okay and then you will find that this is your let us suppose that this is your P1 and this would be your p1 okay and then you have a p2 here then this is your p2 that means for a given t this mechanism is able to this, this mechanism is able to show that there would be what is called as two explosion limits so you, so you have a explosion regime here and no explosion on this side 
or in other words in the PT plane in the PT plane this line marks a boundary which corresponds to crossing over to explosion all right that is to say if I were to fix my temperature and keep going up in pressure that is like saying go horizontally in this direction I now cross an explosion point and get into an explosive region until I get to P2 when the gas phase termination uh, begins to predominate over uh, the chain branching and therefore I, I cross into the no explosion limit all right and this obviously can actually move back and forth as you change the temperature yes please. Yeah. So there you have written test to zero. I'm sorry. Thank you. Was there a cause of confusion for about twenty minutes? We should have remedied it long ago, right? So okay. So we now can explain this, right? So this is this is the famous S curve. Although although it's an inverted S, but uh, it's okay. Uh, we'll just call it an S curve. We always name things based on what we what we what we're familiar with. Um, so then the question arises: Hey, the S curve also has another point, P three. That's not explained by this one here. Okay. So how did you get the S curve? This is an experimental observation. That means you now take what is this P and T that we are looking at those are the initial pressure and temperature. So you now take a reactant mixture at a particular pressure and temperature okay if it were to be located somewhere here that means it is not going to explode chemically explode but if you were to take a chemical mixture and get it up to a certain pressure and temperature that would locate itself somewhere here that means it is going to go through a chemical explosion. All right, that's what it really means. Or you could take a chemical mixture and then keep it over here. Your DCP by DT is not going to be infinity, and then keep on increasing your pressure, and then you're going to go through an explosion as you now cross that curve, that, 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 that limit. And if you now keep doing this experiment, you will find that this you, you get this curve for different temperatures. You do this, and you get you, you get this curve, and the curve is actually an inverse S shape. Whereas what we have done so far can explain only about two pressures to two limits okay it does not explain the third limit that is also observed okay. So how are we explain the two limits it is essentially looking at chain branching versus a surface termination or chain branching versus a gas phase termination okay. The state of the mixture is at the, at the line at that S curve inverted S curve. What will happen? It will then you have to look at you, you, then then you go a little bit further. You have to look at stability. So what we have done is only to look at the equilibrium. Okay. So you have to perturb, and then you will find that if you if you, if you're um, if you if you're here, then you have. I don't, don't want to get into this. So strictly speaking, if you're like into stability, you will draw like a dotted line for this and a solid line for this and and so on. So the solid line indicating that it is stable at that point whereas the dotted line indicates it is unstable okay so unstable or stable really means that depending upon which way you put it okay you, you put up into the um, uh, no explosion side it will not explode but if you put up in the explosion side it will continue to explode and so, and so on that is, that is if it is unstable and, and, and so on so let us let's not, let's not get into that that getting it getting further out okay um, so fine we will we'll just uh, keep it that way. The question then is uh, what about the third limit right there are there are a quite a few expl explanations for this one of the explanations that I would like to um, in, in fact this this is this is observed for let us say the H2O2 system right observed uh, observed for uh, okay so S curve as observed for the H2O2 system um, so the, the question is about the third limit there are a couple of uh, two or three theories about this 
uh, all of this act actually coacting with each other one of the things that we have been talking about when we are talking about changing pressure is the competition between unimolecular to bimolecular reactions or bimolecular to termolecular reactions. So when you are now looking at very high pressures then the termolecular reactions become very important okay. So the question then is you now look at the scheme that we already had depicted earlier for H2O2 system a, 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 a basic 9 step reaction scheme okay where uh, you now have a, a termolecular reaction step. So this is now going to give rise to a, a new intermediate as opposed to OH and OH alone you now have a HO2 that also has a surface termination and a gas phase termination you see. So the termolecular reaction giving rise to a new intermediate is, is, is one of the mechanisms that explains a very high pressure uh, limit. This is, this is one, one idea. The second idea is you now also get into a um, H2O2 cycle that means at this, at this time we are not really bothered about the formation of hydrogen peroxide right. So um, the there is a we, we, we find a we find a third limit in the experiments right so this is um, due to importance of uh, termolecular reactions at very high pressures so the production of HO2 HO2 is a um, is a hydroperoxy radical so uh, at very high pressures you now have the importance of production of hydroperoxy radical and the second idea here is um, uh, we need to consider reactions involving uh, involving uh, H2O2 as well uh, so example I am saying example because this is not exhaustive okay um, as a matter of fact we have about 9 reactions here um, in reality you might have to consider something like 40 reactions and uh, uh, maybe 9 species okay so the 9 species here would be like H2 O2 H O O H H um, H2 O2 H O O H H2 O H2 H O2 H2 O2 O3 okay so we may have to consider as many as 9 species and about 40 reactions but the idea basically is what is the least number of reactions and species that we need to consider to explain a certain phenomenon that is the way we would approach chemical kinetics all the time all right uh, so that is a reduced mechanism that we need to adopt. So here uh, for consideration of H2O2 uh, we may have to say let us say we now have HO2 plus uh, HO2 that is 2 HO2 gives H2O2 plus O2 um, HO2 plus H2 gives H2O2 plus H H2O2 plus OH gives H2O plus HO2 H2O2 plus H gives H2O plus OH H2O2 plus H gives HO2 plus H2 and H2O2 plus M that is a gas phase termination gives 2OH plus M you see 
there are a couple of things that I would like to point out with, with a new intermediate that could be formed first of all if you want to look at what happened to the HO2 in this reaction step we now said HO2 is um, get, getting produced by this thermolecular reaction that would be pretty important at high pressures number one second thing how does it get um, absorbed it has a surface termination and it has a gas phase termination the gas phase termination is HO2 plus H2 which is a stable product, uh, reactant produces a stable product water plus OH but there is an alternative path right so you could now say HO2 plus H2 produces H2O2 plus H all right now this is another chain branching right and it now produces a new intermediate H2O2 which could now get consumed in a in a succession of steps and notice that this for example is a reverse of that okay so has H2O2 is being produced it could equilibrate with its its consumption in a, in, a, in a reverse reaction right so you could have a, a, a second set of uh, intermediate production uh, that, that, that is possible here as a, as a as a secondary route to a, a, a termination of a particular intermediate at, at a, a high pressures and of course the, the last possibility that is that is uh, term, termed is uh, a thermal that is uh, um, it is not really a chemical explosion so not, not necessarily just a chemical explosion uh, the third, third thing is uh, uh, the third limit could be thermal in nature that is to say uh, reaction rates are uh, shoot up so high so high and, and, and these reactions are, the, are exothermic keep in mind so when you now have exothermic reactions that are happening very fast right then you have a huge rate of generation of heat right that could actually increase the temperature and as, as the temperature increases the reaction rates increase further right and as the reaction rates increase further the, the heat release rate increases further as well and, and so on right so that is that's what is called as a thermal runaway and uh, um, so uh, under, under these conditions under these conditions uh, the steady state approximation is not valid in other words you could not hope to explain the third limit particularly within the within the um, framework of a steady state approximation okay. So you have to account for the thermal runaway uh, in, in explaining the third limit so effectively we are saying essentially that a, a, a uh, mechanism like this is essentially taking care of only one kind of intermediate if you now have multiple intermediates you might have other limits as seen in, uh, in, in a H2O2 skeletal mechanism uh, plus a additional possibility of H2O2 formation uh, keep in mind another aspect is the term molecular versus bimolecular which becomes important at high pressures so these are the things that actually constitute uh, the third limit is, is what we can say from uh, here. Uh, the next thing that we want to now say when we are now beginning to talk about thermal uh, is uh, where do we go from here. So let us now look at the possibility of combining chemical and thermal processes. In the very first class we talked about combustion is having convection and diffusion and chemical reaction 
convection is about the flow diffusion is about mixing of uh, species and then you have the chemical reactions anyway and of course we said that we are essentially looking at typically fast chemical reactions right when we said fast we are essentially looking at the chemical kinetics so this is something that we did after we did the chemical equilibrium that would give you the adiabatic flame temperature so we've done a chemical equilibrium all right and then we have done chemical kinetics the chemical equilibrium gives you what the adiabatic flame temperature should be for the final products assuming that they exist in equilibrium chemical kinetics basically tells you what happens to the rates of reactions when they now depart from equilibrium end states it means you start from reactants and then now you want to proceed towards products what is the rate at which you are now going to go from here to there right as you now depart from an equilibrium initial state and, a, and proceed towards a equilibrium final state you are now departing from this equilibrium and going towards another equilibrium right all along when we are doing chemical kinetics we are not really worried about changing temperatures we are saying that a reaction rate is equal to a rate constant times concentrations raised to their stoichiometric proportions and the concentrations will depend on pressure but the rate constant is the one that will depend on temperature in an exponential fashion right so if I were to now look at a system of reactions where multiple species are involved and I want to actually keep track of rate of production of a particular species in all the reactions put together it could be getting produced in one reaction getting consumed in another reaction I now have to sum over all the rates of production of that particular species in each of those reactions across all the reactions and then I have to keep and keep track of what is the rate constant for each of those reactions times the products of the concentration in those reactions raised to their respective stoichiometric coefficients and so on and in all these things I now get a system of ODEs right which which are for each of those concentrations the rate of rate of production of those those species concentrations right DCI over DT and then what we did was well we say ODEs are very very non-linear you have an initial value problem all right but you have to now solve these things simultaneously these are stiff equations because you now have very small chemical times that you have to take care of and so on therefore we said if you, if you, if you, if you apply a steady state approximation you could now set a bunch of DCI over DTs equal to 0 because all of them are intermediates and keep track of only the, the, the stable species reaction rates or, or production rates another way was a partial equilibrium approach where we said that those reactions that are involving intermediates could be assumed to exist um, in equilibrium with each other because they are happening very fast when compared to the final step right the thereby we now say we can replace the ODEs for those uh, species by algebraic equations through their equilibrium constants so these are things that we would try to play with under different conditions to 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 um, uh, simplify our equation set all along not bothering about what happens to the temperature in other words if you now have a set of reactions that are happening they would give out heat and take out heat okay we never really bothered about it and we did not worry about what is the net heat that is produced in this set of reactions and uh, while you are doing combustion we are expecting heat out as, as, a, as a net thing there are some reactions that are going to take away heat because they, they are endothermic but largely we are expecting that many, many reactions are going to put out heat right so when you are in high school you write these simple um, uh, reactions and then you put a delta H at the end okay we never did that when we did chemical kinetics we did that when we were doing thermodynamics then we dropped that habit because we are now looking at how fast we want to go we did not worry about what is the heat that is going to come right now what is the problem why, 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 why should we have worried about it or can't we just worry about the, 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 the rates alone should we, should we worry about the heats along that, that come along the answer is when the heat is going to come along it is going to heat up the place and when, the, when it heats up the place the temperature is going to change the temperature changes the reaction rates are going to change right and the reaction rates are going to change the heat release is going to change 
and the temperature is going to change and so on. So the real problem is in taking it into account not only the chemical kinetics but also the changes in temperature because of the heat release that happens in these chemical reactions right. This is still not bothering about the flow and mixing we are still not really looking at a full blown combustion problem but we go take baby steps we do equilibrium we do depart from equilibrium and look at how fast then we start worrying about what is happening to the heat that comes along and the changes in temperature that that will that will influence the how fast thing again right. So that is the next step that we want to do so here we neglect mixing right whenever you neglect something it does not mean that it does not exist okay you are you are taking it for granted right. So that is what you do with your parents and teachers huh? <laughs> you, you neglect them not because they do not exist right <laughs> you just take them for granted. So here again what you what you are doing here is we are saying that it is all perfect everything is fine no problem my, my, my parents always love me so what is the problem huh? so, so it is like we, the, that is we assume we assume a perfect mixing all the time that is again to, 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 to uh, further elaborate we say uniform instantaneous mixing right uniform to cover space and instantaneous to cover time that means at all times and in all places you expect mixing to happen uniformly therefore any species that is there is there everywhere instantaneously okay. So if you now have a mixture of species reactants products intermediates all of them get mixed instantaneously everywhere in the region that we are interested in this is what we are basically assuming right that means you do not worry about spatial concentration gradients and this is going to become very important when we start thinking about mixing in greater detail okay spatial gradients and concentration are the ones that are going to drive mixing we now suppose that you have a spatial uniformity all the time that means if you now have a change in the concentration that that, that leads to a instantaneous mixing so that the concentration is uniformly spread in space so that you do not have any spatial concentration gradients that will drive the mixing okay is it okay. Is it okay to do this? Well, there are conditions under which this will be very useful for, for us to think about. Okay. So, for example, what, what, what we are basically saying is the mixing has to be so fast, right? Now, typically, mixing is not really as fast as chemical reactions when you are now looking at combustion kind of chemical reactions, right? So, how does it? Well, why don't I take my hand and put in there and then start mixing as vigorously as I can? Yeah, sure, yes. Of course, do don't do this because you're gonna get, get your hands burnt. Okay, you can put a spoon and, and start stirring. Right? So this is this is very typical. I mean, what you're talking about now is to promote mixing through things like turbulence. Okay, so if you now have like a highly turbulent situation, okay where the turbulent mixing is going to promote a, a uh, homogenization of this of this mixture okay instantaneously then we take advantage of that and we think the turbulent combustion is very complicated but there are regimes of turbulent combustion which could which we could take advantage of there is like so much turbulence in there that it just smears out everything and then the mixing is complete we do not have to worry about it right. So that is a kind of uh, approximation that we could that, that we could apply 
to many practical systems as we will see right. So we can also in many in many situations in many situations we can also neglect the details of the flow details of the flow that means you either do not have a significant flow at all to, to, to talk about okay in relation to what is what we are thinking about that is chemistry and, and temperature, temperature gradients and so on or the flow is so complicated that we do not want to worry about the details okay it is always like a comp it is either either like you do not have when you say you neglect mixing that could have been fine when you did not have any mixing to worry about but what we are basically saying is there is a lot of mixing that is going on that we do not have to worry about it okay. Similarly when we say we can neglect details of the flow then that means either you do not have too much flow okay that is good or you have so much flow that that is going around that is very difficult for you so what do you mean by so much flow turbulent flow right. So when you now say turbulent mixing it is basically caused by a flow turbulence is essentially a, a fluid dynamic situation the mixing that comes with it is accompanying the turbulence right. So in a, in a sense when you are now trying to put these two together they, they go together the, the assumptions basically kind of go together we are, we are, if you are thinking about a intense turbulent combustion situation then the flow field is so complicated that we do not want to worry about it okay it neglect its details and it also facilitates a more instantaneous mixing that we do not have to worry about it okay. So many sometimes sometimes we could admit a simple description. of the flow in a way that does not really affect our focus on looking at the coupling between chemical and thermal reactions and the thermal processes right chemical chemical reactions and the and the, and the heat. So essentially we are looking at a, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are now taking a magnifying glass and looking at only a coupling between two things the chemical reactions and the thermal field that it creates. Okay. Anything else that comes around is something that we want to neglect and look for situations when we can neglect it right. So if you can allow for a simple description of a flow in some conditions some situations right that does not really come in the way of our looking at this combination then we could admit it right. So let us just look at when are those conditions that are possible right. So the balance here so the balance to be considered here is between between production or consumption. Of, uh, uh, of 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 species in chemical reactions and the thermal energy associated with it. right obviously we want to do this in a region that is uh, that is meaningfully when you now say you cannot you want to have instantaneous mixing it is possible only in a small region right. So we would now want to confine our attention to uh, in a region okay in a region um, such as a a reactor 
So typically a reactor is a terminology that is uh, used by chemical engineering people uh, the, the aerospace people call it a combustor okay uh, but essentially the chemical engineering people are looking at like a broader set of chemical reactions that are possible than just combustion kind of reactions so they would call it call a region where they want to have chemical reactions happen as a reactor okay and then we are looking at a intense mixing happening in a region that we want to call a reactor okay so what are the typical kinds of reactors that we want to look at that will facilitate handling this restricted set of conditions <clears throat> is a question broadly we could say broadly we can say reactors are like fixed mass reactors or open flow all right that means you are now taking a certain mass of reactants allowing for the reaction to happen and the reactants now become products but the mass does not change right mass is conserved in a chemical reaction anyway therefore the mass of the products should be the same as the mass of the reactants or the mass of the system that we are talking about should remain the same through the reaction right. So this is now looking at a fixed mass system on the other hand you could have open reactors that means you now have an inlet and an outlet yeah. So you now have reactants come in this way go through some reactions and get out as products so it is sort of like a open system right and it is a open flow system right so you cannot really talk about a fixed mass you might be able to talk about a fixed mass flux or a mass flow rate right when you now talk about a fixed mass flow rate that means implicitly you are thinking like a steady state so on, on a steady state basis if I now keep in a, a, a flux of reactants come in this way a flux of products go out that way and there is like a uh, intermediates that are formed and uh, and get quenched by the time uh, you, you have the products that go out right all of this is happening all the time. So that is like a steady state situation as opposed to that a fixed mass reactor is like a batch process where you now take a certain mass you have of reactants and you have to allow for things to change in time from a set of reactants to set of products right obviously that is not steady state things change in time okay. So we are essentially looking at uh, uh, fixed mass systems right we look for a set of ODEs right in time in time for a chemical composition and temperature and temperature previously when we were worried only about chemical kinetics as if the temperature was fixed artificially by us externally that is possible you could actually have a chemical um, chemical reactions happening in a bath that is maintained externally by a constant temperature right that is what we were thinking earlier on for a physical system okay but here in addition to the chemical composition so when you say composition we are now talking about let us say let us let us fix it we are now talking about um, molar concentration ci for the i s species i going from 1 to n for n species right so in addition to the concentrations uh, molar concentrations of chemical species that will give the chemical composition as a function of time we also have to track the temperature as a function of time that means you need to have a 
ordinary differential equation in time for temperature as well that is like d capital T over d small t okay that must be a rate equation of sort for, for, for the temperature change in time okay um, given initial conditions in these right so this would actually be a initial value problem what you will find is the rate of the rate of rea, uh, production net net rate of production of each of the species whose composition the, whose concentrations that we are interested in will depend on the concentrations of lots of other species and temperature and similarly the rate of change of temperature the equation that we write for the rate of change of temperature with time will involve the rate of production of um, other species which in turn means that it will involve the concentrations of other the, the, the species. So you are now looking at a couple set of ODEs okay that is each equation in the set has variables that are present in most of the equations that means you have to solve all the equations simultaneously okay. So that is a that is one initial value problem for the entire simultaneous set of equations on the other hand if you now look at open open flow systems we assume them to be steady steady that means we, we just say let us not worry about um, unsteadiness that means we do not worry about evolution of the concentrations from reactants to products okay in time and, and correspondingly the temperature that is also associated with it okay that means we do not have to have ODEs we could simply look for algebraic set of equations you, you or in, in, a, in a crude sense we will look at the details a lot more carefully as we go along but in a crude sense it is essentially saying let us now throw away terms that involve d by dt okay or any change in uh, anything with respect to temperature with time we let us get rid of it you now set it, set it equal to 0 at steady state then a ODE with the first derivative a first order ODE with the first derivative thrown in you do not have any differential equation anymore right. So effectively you will you, you, you could reduce your system of equations to a simultaneous algebraic set of equations right so um, we could so we could get uh, uh, a, a algebraic set of equations uh, should say set of algebraic equations um, equations uh, in concentrations and uh, temperature right okay why am I saying we could is if you do not consider any spatial variation okay now what we looked for avoiding earlier is a spatial variation in um, spatial gradients and concentration if you assume that spatial gradients and concentration do not exist but let us suppose that you now have a, a duct that could be a convergent divergent nozzle where reactions are happening like for example at the uh, towards the exhaust of rockets okay so when you now have chemical reactions that are happening in a combustion chamber and pushing into a convergent divergent duct you have a flow so if it is possible for you to have a simple description of the flow and the flow changes as we go along because of the convergence convergence and divergence and so on that is going to distribute your temperature and uh, and species in a convective manner not in a diffusive manner okay diffusive is what we are trying to avoid in our uh, in our formulation but you could look at a variation in space purely because of convection by admitting a simple description of the flow so or we could we could um, get 
ODEs again but this is not ODEs ODEs in time but ODEs in space okay so ODEs in space in 1D space that is the reason why it is ODEs space for uh, concentration and temperature concentrations and temperature temperature um, by admitting a simple let us say quasi 1D flow description all right. So it is possible for us to actually try to do a few different things within this framework effectively okay and we will now for different many of these different conditions we will now be able to get a ODEs in time or ODEs in space or algebraic equations which are simply taking into account only the chemical reactions the mass production of species or mass depletion of species and the heat release that that is associated with them doing an energy balance of that okay we will we'll continue from here on Monday.